Good evening, I'm Janella Massa. Andrew and Adrian are away. Tonight, just in time for New Year's, Quebec brings back the curfew. We have to take care of each other. New measures to stop the surge as Omicron changes the rules. Omicron is a new enemy. We must take a different approach. Ontario caps testing and brings in fourth shots as provinces scramble to keep healthcare systems and workplaces up and running. All it takes is for one person in here all of a sudden to be a close contact and that just, you know, the dominoes keep on dropping. 36 days and counting to the Winter Olympics. There's just a lot of mayhem right now in the sports world. Questions mounting about the safety of the games as Omicron cases climb worldwide. And it's that time of year. At Issue turns over the microphone to you. Hi, At Issue panel. I have two questions. What policy decision of 2021 do you think will have the most positive long-term impact on Canadians? You ask, they answer. This is The National. In the country's top pandemic hotspots, daily new cases are literally off the charts, as in we can no longer accurately count them. The capacity to deliver tests is maxed out, Ontario adding new restrictions on who can get one. If we had the capacity, we would offer the testing. This is a finite capacity. Uh, we, uh, I don't think anywhere in the world expected the transmissibility of Omicron. Tonight, we'll take you through Omicron's evolving impact on the return to school, the return to work, and the situation on the front lines. As provinces reach their limits of their testing capacity, the big question is, what about hospital capacity? Over the past week, COVID admissions to ICUs are up about 20% in Ontario and 50% in Quebec. For now, still low, but rising. Well, Sarah Levitt shows us despite similar concerns, those two hard hit provinces are tackling Omicron differently. New restrictions. Faced with an already strained healthcare system, Premier Francois Legault says the added restrictions are necessary. COVID 19 hospitalizations are rising and more and more healthcare workers are testing positive. Quebec needs you to provide healthcare to those who need it. Starting tomorrow, there will be a curfew between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Private gatherings are done and one family household bubbles are back. Extreme measures aimed at slowing community spread. Ontario's measures today more targeted as cases spread like wildfire. It announced it is cutting capacity limits for large events to 1,000 or 50 percent, whatever smaller. Also an admission. The era of widespread testing is over. We've not thrown in the towel. We've got multiple surveillance options. Ontario is now giving free PCR testing to high-risk, vulnerable groups, healthcare workers and patients in hospitals. Those with mild symptoms won't be tested. The 100,000 test capacity, we're hitting it already. Uh, and when 30-40% of the tests are already positive, with a number we've never seen before, we know there's widespread community uh, activity. That's why people with symptoms are being told to presume it's COVID and to isolate. New rules there too, down from 10 days in isolation to five or seven if you work in a high-risk healthcare setting. Ontario is focusing on protecting the most vulnerable, now offering those in long-term care homes a fourth dose. In two provinces, two approaches to Omicron and concern from some that Ontario may be forced to follow Quebec. Slowing transmission there is intended, I think, to specifically target the stress on the healthcare system. Ontario isn't feeling it as much as Quebec is yet. And so the, the urgency to slow transmission is not yet being felt. I'm concerned that we will feel it here and we may have to enact similar strategies as Quebec is now putting on the table. All right, Sarah, we heard some concerns there about Ontario's approach, but what are experts saying about Quebec's? Well, some criticism here as well. Some doctors saying that the Quebec government has already acted too late and the effects of these latest restrictions won't be felt for at least a few weeks. Janella? All right, thanks. That's Sarah Levitt. Well, those capacity limits for events in Ontario prompted an announcement from the company that owns the Leafs and the Raptors. For the next three weeks, tickets are cancelled. 
Leafs and Raptors ticket holders will not be admitted to games starting tomorrow night. The only people allowed into venues will be those mandated by collective agreements, staff and team invites up to a thousand seats. That will leave the stands mostly empty. Today, once again, COVID cases reached new record highs as the numbers rolled in across the country. This wash of red is becoming the norm. And remember, as high as these numbers are, the real picture is almost certainly worse. You can see those sky high numbers in Ontario and Quebec and Alberta and BC. But every one of those areas is seeing more cases now than they've ever seen before. More cases means more people isolating. That is leading to a whole other concern, staffing shortages. Ontario wasn't the only province to change its isolation rules today. Marina von Stackelberg with what others are doing. Corey Arsenault expects more of his employees to start calling in sick. All it takes is for one person in here all of a sudden to be a close contact and that just, you know, the dominoes keep on dropping. Concerned workplaces will be debilitated by exposures. PEI is changing its public health orders. If there's an outbreak at an essential workplace, employees who are close contacts can stay on the job if they test negative. When they are not at work, they are to be in isolation. This policy is not without risk and will be used sparingly. Staffing issues are cropping up all over the place. WestJet has cancelled 15% of its flights next month, saying many employees are out sick. In Manitoba, more than 400 healthcare workers have been infected in the last week. Winnipeg's Health Authority has asked employees with COVID symptoms who test negative to come to work. We see that as a way of um, supporting the healthcare system in a safe way. Nova Scotia is asking for volunteers to start giving boosters to everyone 30 and up. We need some help. We need more people. So if you're a retired nurse or doctor or and are able to fill shifts vaccinating Nova Scotians, please put your hand up. In Saskatchewan, as Omicron spreads, isolation rules are changing. We're going to have more people that are self-isolating. Um, and ultimately, that's going to have an impact on the services that we uh, need to continue to offer, not only in our healthcare system, but also in our communities. So people who test positive but are vaccinated and don't have symptoms only have to isolate for five days, not ten. Some worry all these changing measures could spell trouble. There's no simple way to manage this, but honestly, with Omicron, it's inevitable that there will be outbreaks, large outbreaks that will occur. Dr. Alex Wong says Omicron is quickly becoming a dangerous balancing act to stop the virus's rapid spread while keeping society afloat. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Toronto. All this as we crash toward the end of winter break for the country's students. Today, more provinces and territories announced they would delay the return to school. In Ontario, though, the focus is on getting kids back to class as soon as possible, sending teachers in with more air filters and N95 masks. Deanna Sumac-Johnson now on what changed and the reaction. Sumaya Ahmed waited nervously for the announcement and says learning schools will reopen on January 5th with just two days delay did not give her much comfort in sending her four-year-old back. I'm debating if the situation is still bad, if we're still getting 14,000 cases a day, I might just not send them to school. Just not do any school for, for a while. Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health said that two additional days will allow the province to deliver additional measures. Investments that we've made uh, in improved masking for educators, uh, improved masking for children, improved ventilation, make our schools very safe. Uh, relative to any other areas of, of the community. Uh, and our children have sacrificed a lot in the last 20 months. Ontario's decision comes in contrast to Quebec. School, CEGEP and universities will remain closed until January the 17th. Regular daycare will remain open and school daycare services will remain open, but only for essential workers. Northwest Territories and Alberta both delay the start of the school year by a week. Alberta will also distribute masks and rapid tests to staff and students. Pressing pause is something some experts wish Ontario had done too.
today uh, the numbers are almost 14,000, the highest we've ever seen in this pandemic. And most people are not getting so sick. I think it's because we have a high rate of vaccination. But the, what concerns me is that children, uh, a lot of children are not vaccinated. This teachers union president says N95 masks are a good start, but has some other concerns. There's 3,000 HEPA filters apparently that are going to be on their way and there's absolutely no way they're all going to arrive in by January 5th. Why aren't we being prioritized for the boosters? And that's something I didn't hear. After two years of COVID uncertainty for teachers, parents and students, 2022 so far at least is showing no signs of being any different. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Ontario's announcement limiting PCR and even rapid tests means we won't be getting a clear picture of how many people are sick in the country's biggest province. But they're not the first province to do that. Julia Wong shows us what could be at stake when you stop measuring. We have to pivot uh, given the sheer infectiousness of this virus. Ontario's move to join several other provinces limiting PCR tests to those medically vulnerable or working in high-risk settings means case counts will be even more underreported. If you have symptoms of COVID-19, you should assume that you have COVID-19 and isolate. Another option, if you have them, take a rapid test. But in much of the country, that rapid test will go uncounted. Albertan Jarvis Schmidt got a positive rapid test result Boxing Day. I remember someone saying something about, uh, you know, like it's good to have these records on hand. But no province tracks rapid test positives. Vancouver Coastal Health wants people who test positive at home to complete a form online. Alberta says people can alert their family doctor. And Peterborough, Ontario is asking residents to report results using a QR code. A piecemeal effort is not going to be as good in terms of um, the ability to have a good sense of actually how many people are infected right now. What's the predicted burden that that's going to lead to for hospitalization? And when will we be through this? There is international precedent for local reporting. The United Kingdom has been asking people to submit positive and negative rapid test results the last nine months. The best data that we've had about the COVID pandemic has been from the United Kingdom, and that's been because of their strong data analytic framework. They have data on cases linked to hospitalization and vaccination, and that is world class. And at the individual level, those concerned not having any medical record of a confirmed case could cause people trouble down the line. Will disability insurance companies accept those when later on people are looking at long-term disability for benefits and for access to services? Will those self-reported results be accepted? We don't know. Uncertainty in a pandemic that continues to throw curveballs at Canadians. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Well, the federal government has opened availability to its Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit. That benefit gives $300 a week in temporary income support for those unable to work because of a COVID-19 lockdown or capacity restriction. The program was supposed to go online in the new year, but applications opened today. In her first New Year's address since becoming Governor General, Mary Simon says Canadians have inspired her. Despite a difficult year, they've shown resilience and compassion. Here's some of that message. Together, we are combating the COVID-19 pandemic with vaccinations and public health measures. Together, we are thinking of creative and innovative solutions to save our planet. Together, we are walking the path of reconciliation on a lifelong journey of healing, respect, and understanding. With every hard question we ask, we find answers to how we can make Canada a truly inclusive and sustainable country. The Governor General's message was released in three languages, English, French, and Inuktitut. You can hear all of it, just head online to cbcnews.ca. Well, New York City is still planning to go ahead with its New Year celebration despite high COVID cases there. Three, two, one, Happy New Year! 
today. They went through some last minute tests for the ball drop. This year's Times Square crowd will be masked, vaxxed and socially distanced. On why there will be one at all, today Mayor Bill de Blasio said he wants to show the world New York City is fighting our way through this. Dramatic video out of Colorado today as families were forced to flee a Chuck E. Cheese because of a fast moving wildfire. Tens of thousands of people in two communities near Boulder have now been evacuated. Authorities say hurricane forced wind gusts are fueling the quickly spreading fires. Hundreds of homes have burned. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke to his Russian counterpart today. A phone call at the request of Vladimir Putin amid Russia's massive troop buildup near Ukraine. And the growing fear that an invasion is in the works. Travis Danrash has that story. Over the course of 50 minutes from his home in Delaware, President Joe Biden urged Vladimir Putin to take steps to de-escalate the crisis on Russia's border with Ukraine where nearly 100,000 Russian troops are now poised. A U.S. official described the talks as serious and substantive. Their second call this month. Putin wants a promise that Ukraine will never become a NATO member, a promise Biden won't make. That is a red line uh, for Russia, and I, I really think that is the bottom line. Uh, and if necessary, Putin would resort to some sort of uh, force. Biden warned again Moscow could face strict sanctions, but Kremlin sources say Putin pushed back, saying that could lead to a complete breakdown in relations. Putin feels he's back into a corner. That this expert says NATO forces, including some from Canada that were moved into the region in 2014, have aggravated the situation. If you think how the United States felt when the Soviet Union put missiles in Cuba 60 years ago, you get a sense of how and why Putin feels he's back into a corner. That's what makes this so dangerous. They need to figure out, both of them, how they can each back off. Putin has got plenty of reason why he would need to have a distraction. Rising COVID cases, a stagnant economy, and a growing opposition movement, experts say those are all considerations for the Russian president right now. If the Russians look over the border and see a democratic and prosperous and free Ukraine, it's going to be bad news for him. Now, the White House says its push for a diplomatic solution will continue, including sending negotiators to meet with Russian counterparts in the next few weeks in Geneva. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Washington. Well, the Olympics are just over a month away, but with Omicron spreading so quickly, will they be safe? Olympic honchos, those who run the Olympics, are perfectly willing to gamble with public health in order to make the Olympics happen. Coming up, the mountain of challenges facing athletes just weeks before the opening ceremony. Plus... My question for the At Issue panel is... My question for the At Issue panel is... From policy to politics, you asked, the At Issue panel answered, and... We head to the birthplace of the violin, where a Canadian carries on a centuries-long tradition. From start to finish, it takes about 150 hours. We're back in two. At St. George's Hospital in London today, a sign of what could be on the way for England. With COVID cases climbing, so-called surge hubs are being constructed at eight UK hospitals. If needed, they can each house 100 COVID patients. Plans are also being made to add another 4,000 super surge beds. Or less than six weeks away from the Winter Olympics in Beijing. And while the sports world is getting ready for another Olympic Games during a pandemic, this time officials are facing a new highly transmissible threat in Omicron. Renee Filipponi shows us what that changes. Rehearsals in Beijing are underway to ensure everything runs smoothly, pushing ahead with the Games despite growing concerns about COVID. There's just a lot of mayhem right now in the sports world, and it's certainly affecting what's happening as we move closer to Beijing. 
The bobsleigh World Cup in Latvia is a major Olympic qualifying event, but some Canadian racers have had to pull out over a COVID outbreak. A number of key curling qualifiers have also been cancelled, leaving Canadian Olympic hopeful Chelsea Carey tweeting that it's perhaps time to consider postponing the Olympics. The International Olympic Committee needs to make that call, and critics say it's unlikely they will. Olympic honchos, those who run the Olympics, are perfectly willing to gamble with public health in order to make the Olympics happen. Events at this summer's Tokyo Olympics went mostly undisrupted by COVID, though hundreds of cases were connected to the Games. Of course, that was before the Omicron variant. We are in the middle of a surge in cases globally due to this really highly virulent um, Omicron variant. So I think there are risks to, to large events like this and, and they're well established. In a statement, the Canadian Olympic Committee says it's monitoring the impact of the Omicron variant closely and have added safety measures including mandating vaccinations, chartering flights and increasing testing. U.S. star skier Michaela Schriffen pulled out of the World Cup this week after testing positive. Athletes in her position are now worried about the PCR testing they will need to get before the Games. Athletes who have cleared infections and who have gotten COVID, you know, weeks before the Olympics, who have recovered, who aren't capable of spreading the disease anymore, can still be testing positive on PCR tests. And with just 36 days till these Olympics, there are still many unknowns as this latest wave of COVID ripples around the world. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Pop star, activist and former Montrealer Denise Ho has been released by authorities in Hong Kong. Ho was released on bail this afternoon after being detained for 36 hours. The Canadian citizen was taken into custody along with six journalists as part of a police raid on a pro-democracy news outlet. She confirmed her release on Twitter saying she's now safe at home. Next on The National, after another year of COVID and a federal election, you had some pressing questions. My question is, first, what do you think is different about Mr. Trudeau that has made him somewhat more resilient to that loss of popularity? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel tackle the topics on your mind. That's next. Hi, Ad Issue panel. Hello. My question for the Ad Issue panel is... I want to end 2021 on a high note, and so my question for the At Issue panelists is this. My question for the At Issue panel is... I have two questions for the At Issue panel today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of At Issue. It's my favorite edition because I don't have to do very much. It's your chance to ask your political questions about some of the biggest moments of the year and, and what you want to, to know about what's to come in politics. Here with me for one last time in 2021, Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, Elkia Raj, and Elamine abdul Mahmoud. Okay, let's get right to our first viewer question. It is a policy question, which I just love. Here's Caitlin. I want to end 2021 on a high note, and so my question for the At Issue panelists is this. What policy decision of 2021 at any level of government do you think will have the most positive long-term impact on Canadians? Thanks and Happy New Year. Great question, Caitlin. Chantal, why don't you take a go at that one? No, I'm going to go for the childcare, uh, affordable childcare outside of the province of Quebec, because I've seen its impact. Um, in this province uh, and on, on labor force issues uh, for families, on work-life balance. And I believe that that policy, um, the way it is framed and with uh, most provinces already on side with agreements, mm -hmm. uh, is probably one that will not be canceled if we change governments because it will be very hard to cancel. Andrew. Uh, carbon pricing. Uh, this is a, an issue that's going to be with us for decades to come. I only wish that the government was placing a greater emphasis on it. Uh, it's in fact only using carbon pricing to achieve about a third of its emissions reductions. Uh, but they've made a, a, a good start on it, shall we say, and it's certainly the key to, to solving this question. Althea. I agree with childcare. I will note that Pierre Polyev has said that the Conservatives do not support it, but I think there's going to be 
um, such a, a popularity push from the premier is that even if some are maybe ideologically opposed that this is a, a new program, and it's kind of rare that you build a new program in a social safety net. So that's definitely, I think, hats off 2021. That was the biggest accomplishment. And it kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, no, it did. It took a pandemic to get the country to finally uh, do it because it's sure been talked about for decades. Elamine. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to a health decision that I think a lot of people expressed some doubt about when they were sort of rolled out and then eventually turned out to be the right one. And that was the decision to sort of prolong the period of time between dose one and dose two of the vaccine. Mm. Uh, we were a country that, uh, you know, we were behind in terms of our supply. And that was like one big criticism. And so, you know, prolonging that period of time allowed us to sort of, you know, get the country back up and running, um, get some people at least vaccinated a little bit, um, which I think like helped us sort of, you know, get to where we are now. Okay, let's move on to our next question. This one is about the Prime Minister. Here is Arslan. Incumbent leaders such as Boris Johnson and Joe Biden are facing a massive popularity crisis where crises like inflation, the ongoing pandemic, are making people sick and tired of their current leaders. Justin Trudeau doesn't seem to be experiencing the same in this country. So my question is, First, what do you think is different about Mr. Trudeau that has made him somewhat more resilient to that loss of popularity? And second, do you think he can remain resilient in that way for long, or will his popularity suffer in 2022 if the pandemic does not end once and for all? Thoughtful question. Andrew, want to take a stab at that? I think the main difference is he suffered his loss of popularity a couple of years ago. Uh, he was once, <laughs> you know, up... I mean, to be frank, I mean, he yes, was once yes. sailing along in the mm -hmm. high 40s or 50s in the approval ratings. He dropped about 20 points and he's really never really recovered. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we saw that in the election. He'd become a liability rather than an asset for mm -hmm. the party. Um, the main thing is, in our system, you can still win elections with 32% yeah. of the vote. Yeah. So um, I think that's still a problem for them. And that's one of the reasons why, while liberals support him now, uh, not a lot of them are terribly keen on seeing him lead them, lead them into the next election. Chantal. I think part of uh, the enduring popularity, if you want to call it that, uh, of Justin Trudeau is uh, sourced in the conservative failure to offer an alternative that the plurality of Canadians uh, across the country would find acceptable, and he benefits from that. But I would also note that uh, in this country, prime ministers have tended to fare rather well uh, as a result of crises, even those that they have mismanaged. Think of Jean Chrétien and the referendum uh, and the post-referendum period. Think of Stephen Harper and the global financial uh, crisis. It actually tends to help uh, government leaders to have an issue that they can focus on that everyone wants them to focus on. Okay, uh, we're going to do one more in this round. We have a lot of questions about Bill 21 in Quebec, given it's back in the news. Here's what Raj wanted to know. My question for the Ad Issue panel is, as multiculturalism is the hallmark of our pluralism, Bill 21 is an anachronism. It is antithetical to all the core values of inclusiveness that define us as Canadians. If the Supreme Court of Canada were to rule in its favour, what avenues are left for us to pursue in order to protect the rights of immigrants? Okay, good question, Raj. Chantal, you want to try that one? Yes, and uh, I'll take issue with the, the rights of immigrants because I don't think that the people who are, uh, uh, who, who are under Bill 21 are necessarily uh, immigrants. Many of them are Quebecers, born and bred, second generation. Yeah. Uh, second, there are two issues. Based on the first court ruling, I don't think the Supreme Court will find that Bill 21 is constitutional, but it will likely find that uh, the notwithstanding clause that protects it from the Charter uh, means that the law can continue to be implemented. And that basically means that uh, this is a clause that has to be revoted every five years. Mm. So they, they, what, what this um, person is asking is, what's the out? If the Supreme Court says yeah. we yeah. can't touch this law, the out is uh, a change in the Quebec outlook on Bill 21 and, and a new government that does not want to protect it and shelter it from the charter. Okay, quickly, uh, Althea. She means the provincial liberals. Not the federal yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um 
I'm going to take a different crack at it. I agree with everything Chantal has said. I think that probably the federal intervention at the Supreme Court will focus on the use of the notwithstanding clause. The Supreme Court has basically interpreted the clause uh, incredibly broadly, like has not put any constraints around it um, when it was asked to do so um, in 1988. So I think it's possible that the justices um, try to define the use of the notwithstanding clause. That yeah. would be really interesting. Um, yeah. You know, is the clause meant to only be used uh, once a court rules against you and not to be used yeah. preemptively? I, like, I would think that would be very fascinating and interesting. And uh, potentially very <laughs> provocative too for, yeah. for the provinces. Elamine. Well, I think it's actually possible that um, the Quebec government is really underestimating how much the rest of Canada cares about this issue. I think like, this is one of those um, issues that has really broken through um, nationally. We see that, you know, the city of Brampton, city of Calgary are joining in a legal challenge um, against, um, against the bill. And I think that's interesting for a few reasons, because I think it could mobilize the federal government to intervene, or at least like allow them to intervene in a meaningful way, like uh, like Althea just said, um, in a way they might have not been motivated to particularly do so before. So I think that's what might change the calculus here. But like, you know, um, aside from that, you know, it's really waiting for it to expire. Andrew, last word. I think there are larger issues in play than just the specific issue of religious minorities in Quebec. First of all, that the use of the notwithstanding clause in this and in other bills in Quebec and in Ontario, for example, is rapidly normalizing what was supposed to be an emergency yeah. safety valve. I think that's a huge issue for the country to deal with. And secondly, the sort of shrugging attitude amongst our federal leaders that this is just a matter of, for Quebec to decide, mm -hmm. that this is just a matter of sort of provincial rights, I think is corrosive of our sense of ourselves as a country. Yeah. Uh, in the United States, if, they, if federal leaders had taken that uh, approach in the United States, the schools would still be segregated. At some point, you have to say, this involves all of us. This isn't just a provincial matter. And what specifically you do to, to try to counter it can be debated. But it has to start with the idea that this matters, that this is intolerable, and that this is fundamental to Canadian sense of self. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, everybody. That was uh, a few questions. We'll get a few more of your questions after this, including this one. What future lies ahead for Canada's increasingly and internally divided Conservative Party? Oh, you'll want to hear the answer to that question. The panelists will weigh in on that and more coming up with Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Ella Mean. Stay with us. Back now with another round of At Issue. Tonight, it's been viewer questions, your questions. Leading our discussion, let's pick up where we left things off. Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Elamine here with me again. Our next question is about the pandemic, sort of. Here's what James asked. I'll read this. Given the recent COVID-19 uh, modeling projections for Ontario, if the Ontario government were to impose another lockdown, how does the panel think this would affect Doug Ford's re-election chances in June? I guess you have to first believe that he would impose another lockdown, and I'm not sure I believe that, but Elamine, you, you start us off. I mean, I have to say that uh, it would basically just remind people of the early missteps of the pandemic, and I think like that's probably the worst possible consequence for Doug Ford at this point. Um, you know, there have been quite a few times where Doug Ford's actions lagged behind expert um, advice. Uh, he took a hit in the polls in those days. He was on his way to recovering, and then now the Omicron variant has come. And I think if you get into that cycle again of lagging behind expert advice, um, that's something that will definitely hurt his chances when we get to yeah. the election. He seems to be a little more responsive to Omicron. Yes. Uh, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Andrew, your, your thoughts on what would happen if Doug Ford had to impose more restrictions? Well, I agree with you that the last round uh, was closer to being on the mark than I think he's been in the past. Okay. Uh, I think he got some credit for it, some praise for it. I think he's been having a better several months, frankly. They've been, some of the policy announcements they've been coming out have actually been, I think, fairly well considered in terms of their electoral prospects and meeting the real needs of people. Um, but we are also at a period where the Omicron thing is so scary to a lot of people who study this closely. At the same time as public weariness with this is, mm -hmm. has really reached, I think, a, a maximum point. So this is a real crunch time where I, I think there's much less uh, margin for error that the public's willing to give people. Althea? I think parents are tired and frustrated and there's this feeling that um, if the PC government had acted earlier on class sizes, on better ventilation in schools, that um, we could have avoided the situation that um, is likely going to face students um, in the weeks and months ahead. 
I think the big challenge really is how much the opposition can make that stick on Doug Ford, because I do agree that he's done a pretty good job of trying to get ahead of this. Mm -hmm. um, there clearly was a demand for much more action from the scientists uh, around the science table. Um, and, uh, you know, as we record this, I don't know what actions he has taken, but I think that th that will greatly diminish. I think what Doug Ford is keenly aware of is that a lot of people that voted for him also voted for Justin Trudeau and they support more action rather than fewer actions. So even though his base might want him to do like no lockdowns, maybe actually the majority of the province wants to make sure their loved ones are remain alive. Okay, next question from uh, Andrew about the Conservative Party. My first question is, what future lies ahead for Canada's increasingly and internally divided Conservative Party? And second, is there a way moving forward for the Conservative Party to reconcile its internal divisions without alienating centrist and left-wing voters? Thanks. A thoughtful question from Andrew. Althea, you want to start us off on that? I think the big problem for the Conservative Party is that the base of the party, the people who go to the convention, who sell uh, memberships to other people, who knock on doors during election campaigns, who donate, are far more to the right than most Canadians and where their actual voter base is. And I think the real challenge for the Conservatives, and I don't think this can be done under Aaron O'Toole, but I think that they should embrace the Liberals model of open memberships where uh, you can, more people who don't want to feel like a, like a, a branded Conservative can um, join the party. And I think that would expand the tent, the voting tent that Aaron O'Toole or any future a potential leader has uh, to make it feel like it is a much broader tent because you're right, or the viewer is right at the moment. Um, it is a very, it's a, a tent with many camps and they disagree with one another. And it's not clear what the way forward is other than outselling memberships and picking a leader that speaks to that one camp, but still remaining the other camps are unhappy. Chantal. They probably uh, need a leader, uh, and I know Aaron O'Toole is trying to be that person this time around that can kind of rise over all these factions yeah. and yeah. have them look together uh, in the same direction, i.e. the taking of power. That is really difficult when your poll numbers are, are terrible. But I think the conservative problem is not that they're going to be shut out of government forever. I think people will tire of the liberals, and at some point mm -hmm. the conservatives will win. Their problem is, once they are in power, can they present a policy set? A, can they get a majority government, uh, which sounds to me like a bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. And if not, can they present a, a set of policies that are both effective, different, but consensual enough that yeah. they can advance them for longer than the two, three years it takes for the opposition to regroup? Mm -hmm. uh, Elamine. I think actually like that is a bigger question is like what what kind of conservatism does this party want to advance in the 21st century what does that look like is there a coherent version of conservatism that matches this moment I don't think so and part of that is because we are in a moment that asks a lot of government um, and the party specifically trying to say like you don't have to ask that much of government and I think but the liberal era has always been that they think that that moment tends to last forever and it doesn't and so it's a matter of you know when this moment begins to end what does it Conservative party, Conservative party has to say, you know, what does it stand for? What is the conservatism it wants to advance then? Andrew. I mean, the formula is not that complicated. You need to be make yourself relevant to the voters, which is to say, <laughs> uh, focusing on the issues that matter, <laughs> focusing on the issues that matter to them and offering solutions to that are rooted in your particular philosophy of government. The two rabbit holes I think they have to avoid going down is on the one hand, uh, the populist culture war fight that a lot of people on the so-called right these days seem transfixed by. But on the other hand, not simply aping liberals and, and making themselves over into liberals light. Mm -hmm. In between those two, there is, I think, uh, an area where you can search for overlap, overlap between what you believe and what the public is willing to buy, particularly, I think, in the area of the economy. So focusing on the economy, focusing on practical solutions rooted in a conservative philosophy, I think, is the way to keep both peace in the party and reach out to the mainstream. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what, what they're trying to do right now. We'll see whether they can make it happen or not. Uh, thank you. Thank all of you. Thanks to everyone who sent in a question. I'll see you all back here in 2022. Thanks. Uh, I will throw things back now to Janella, and she is in Toronto. Thanks, Rosie. Coming up, a Torontonian takes her streets 
to the stage. And I first came determined to be what he told me to be. Turning Toronto's Little Mogadishu into a musical, but first. We speak to a Canadian carrying on historic work where the first violins were made. Stay with us for that. Julia Grosso from Vancouver to win it for Canada! That unforgettable penalty at the Tokyo Olympics has earned Canada's women the honour of being the Canadian Press Team of the Year. And the voting wasn't even close. The gold medal winning team took 38 out of the 44 possible votes cast for the award. Another big honour for a Canadian, this one in the town of Cremona, Italy. Being part of a centuries-long tradition of violin makers where the instrument was born. Megan Williams was there to see it up close. Cremona, the small town nestled in the Po Valley of northern Italy, where 500 years ago, craftsman Nicola Amati created the first violin. And where a century and a half later, Antonio Stradivari took the craft to its highest level, a name still synonymous with violin masterpiece. Today, Canadian violin maker Bernard Newman continues that tradition, using the very same techniques to restore the old masterpieces and carve new ones for the world's top violinists. It starts off as a block of wood. With the help of a Canada Council grant, Newman began training as a luthier some 40 years ago in Cremona and stayed. From start to finish, it takes about 150 hours. Meticulously carving to achieve the rich sound of the old masters. To this day, Cremona lives and breathes stringed instruments. You can't turn a corner here without hearing a snippet of violin music rise from a window. Much of that music coming from Cremona's Stauffer Center for Strings. This fall, it launched the world's first international program for promising young violinists and orchestras, a way to draw top talent to the birthplace of the instrument. American Hannah Cho says being in Cremona has been inspiring. To come here and feel a sense of camaraderie and um, just great personalities, it's really nice to feel like I belong in a little community here. Another Stauffer student, Italian Sofia Manvati, gets the rare opportunity to play on a carefully guarded Stradivarius worth millions, selected from the collection of Cremona's Violin Museum. If you want to do something on these instruments, it's like immediately you can do it and uh, it's amazing. <laughs> As for Newman, he says the entire town and the instruments it's given birth to have been inspiring. Once you've experienced what a um, Namati or a Guarneri or a Stradivari or a Guadagnini can do in, in how it produces the sound, um, then you, you try and fit, work that into your own violin making. A Canadian and his violins, richer for the experience. Megan Williams, CBC News, Cremona. Next, when nobody tells stories like yours, you tell your own. Am I ready to blaze my own path? The first time Just playwright turned her Toronto community into a musical. Thirty-year-old first-time playwright Fatuma Adar is starting with something close to her heart, a musical telling the story of her Toronto community. It's called Dixon Road, and the moment in the spotlight she's giving her community is our moment tonight. I'll try anything to Dixon Road is a story about a Somali family immigrating to Toronto in the 90s. I'll keep on searching. I absolutely love musicals. I love family musicals. And because I grew up with Disney and every musical episode of a television show, I kind of wondered when I would see a musical about a family like mine. When something doesn't exist, you kind of just have to make it. What better prize than getting to a place? So I started fiddling around with the idea. We're inherently a funny 
energetic community uh, with musical tendencies, with rhythmic poetry. So I just gave it a try. Dixon Road is a very special area to the Somali community. Uh, my dad came here to Canada, and this was the first place he settled and had roots. Just... We're in the process of developing the story and figuring out the music. It's very exciting, and it's an incredibly rewarding experience, and I'm probably gonna cry. Fatuma's dad was a cab driver, and he kind of became the neighborhood's go-to guy for Somali newcomers trying to navigate the city. And her family's lived in lots of different places in Toronto since then, but she says Dixon's always had a special place in their heart. The musical Dixon Road is hopefully going to hit the stage in an upcoming season. Of course, hard to say because of the pandemic, but I'll be watching out for it. That's it for us here on The National on this December 30th. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.